turn on the TV. It's neither too esoteric nor too mundane. He be that. It's beginning to feel like home already. You betcha. Need I say more? Hello out there from TV land, a beautiful place to be. Nick at night, better living through good TV. This video is brought to you by Patreon. Patreon, the sign of a good bread. Okay, so let's go back to the beginning of all of this. On September 2nd, 1945, the surrender of Japan to Allied forces was formally signed, officially ending hostilities in Asia and with it, the end of World War II. The American soldiers could finally come home to their parades and girlfriends. Well, I mean, kind of. The actual process of bringing those in the US military back home was actually a pretty messy affair. That's beyond the scope of this video, but Popular CC has a great video on the whole return process and post-war occupations, link in the description below. Anyway, those who fought in the war were coming home to find their country working on a number of post-war subsidiaries, building off of Roosevelt's New Deal programs to recover from the Great Depression. Some of these programs included the mass expansion of suburban neighborhoods in answer to post-war housing shortages and the GI Bill of 1944, which, among other things, allowed servicemen to attend college cheaply and get low interest loans to start their own businesses and farms. These things factored into a post-war economic expansion, rapid growth with high employment. Largely for white America, mind you. The war was over. The depression was over. People who had held off on starting families for reasons of conflict and economy could finally do so with a roof over their heads and a lucrative job providing for them. So, after the war, people started having children. Lots and lots of children. Between 1946 and 1964, 76 million American children were born, the largest increase in the birth rate in decades. On January 28, 1963, Leslie J. Nason wrote an article for the Daily Press about the youngest members of this generation graduating high school and enrolling in college. Nason called them baby boomers, the first use of the term in archive print. 1946 was also the year of the RCA 630TS, the first mass-produced electronic television set. The development of television technology long predated World War II. In fact, its technological evolution can be traced back well into the 19th century through variations in telegraph and radio technologies. The actual word, television, can be traced back to 1900, coined by Russian scientist Konstantin Perskaya at the International World Fair in Paris, in reference to experiments in image transmission. A very basic, hugely oversimplified explanation of television is that of using radio wave signals to instruct the intensity of a light source, a stronger signal resulting in a brighter light, with a device somehow forming that light into the illusion of a moving image. The radio waves bit was actually pretty easy. The real trick was how to display the signal. The first devices we would today recognize as a television set came out in the 1920s and were mechanical in nature, using a spinning disc or drum with small holes. If you spin the device fast enough and modulate the intensity of the light at the right speed, you could get a moving image. A very small resolution, between 16 and 60 lines, and the mechanism wasn't quiet, but still an amazing technology for its time. The first public demonstrations of the mechanical television were presented by John Logie Baird in 1929, and the BBC started broadcasting experimental 30-minute transmissions beginning in 1929 to less than 100 people. Still, while mechanical televisions were neat and helped in developing the infrastructure of the television broadcast, it was largely a technological dead end with minimal commercial value. Thankfully, cathode ray tubes were here to pick up the slack. Again, I'm oversimplifying a lot of science, but when you have a vacuum inside a glass tube, electrons can move freely. And when an electric current is sent through these tubes, the electrons glow in a straight line. If that electron line were to, say, strike a phosphorus material coating on the inside of the tube, the spot the line hits would glow. A signal could be used to modulate the intensity of the electric current, in turn modulating the strength of the electron line, in turn modulating the brightness of the glowing spot on the phosphorus material. The electron line can also be bent by a magnetic field, so with an electronic magnet, you can make that line point anywhere on the far end of the tube, hitting different spots of phosphorus material. 
If you modulate the signal just right and the electric magnet moves fast enough, our brain won't be able to keep up, and through persistence of vision, we'll see a complete image. Again, can't stress this enough, this is the most basic explanation of cathode ray tube televisions, or CRT television. CRTs allowed for a larger screen and far greater resolution than mechanical televisions, and was a lot more quiet to operate. The technology was developed by many people over many years, but what we would recognize as the first electronic television was demonstrated to the public by Philo Farnsworth at the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia in 1934, which included the first ever broadcast of an American football game. There's a fun alternative universe where television kicked off as a popular medium in the 1930s, but the Great Depression meant that kind of expensive luxury item couldn't reach the masses, and World War II meant the production on things like television receivers had to be halted in order to focus on military production. There were a few applications during wartime. For example, RCA provided television sets to hospitals in New York as entertainment for injured servicemen, with programs airing twice a week. But for the most part, television had to wait for that post-war economic boom to be viable. They still weren't cheap. The RCA 630TS initially cost $350, $4,500 when adjusted for inflation, the same price as a decent car. But many post-war families could now afford it. In 1946, about 0.5% of American households had a television set. In 1951, that number went up to 23.5%. 1954, over half of American households had a TV. 1956, over 70%. 1962, 90%. And television broadcasts were rising up to match. The National Broadcasting Company, or NBC, was first out the gate in 1944 with a three-station network broadcasting between New York City and Philadelphia. That was followed by the short-lived Dumont Television Network in 1946, and both the Columbia Broadcasting System and the American Broadcasting System, CBS and ABC, in 1948. It would take until 1951 for these networks to stretch all the way to the West Coast. Television and the baby boomer generation grew up side by side with the television generation becoming another name for the boomers. In 1954, children were watching around 13 hours of television every week, gobbling up variety shows and westerns and puppets like it was candy. Without war and economical worry, without needing to send your young ones out to the fields or the factory, media entertainment became a cornerstone of youth culture. Television, yes, but also Disneyland, opening in 1955. The Silver Age of comic books beginning in 1956 and the rise of pop music and rock and roll through improvements in record production and the development of portable transistor radios. And these media entertainment childhoods would undoubtedly turn into media entertainment nostalgia. However, a few more technological advancements would have to be made before that was possible. Preservation of early television was tricky prior to 1956. Most early televisions were live broadcasts. Plays, concerts, sports, game shows, and even some early sitcoms were being performed the same time you were watching them at home. Sometimes shows would be made on film, I Love Lucy in 1951 being a popular early example, but that was more expensive and therefore uncommon. This was especially inconvenient if you're making a show in New York and want it to air in California. The signal won't go that far, so what do you do? The early solution was kinescope which basically amounted to pointing a film camera at a television screen as the show was airing. It wasn't always the best quality, but it meant you could ship a show across the states, and it's the main way television before 1956 was preserved. 1956, seeing the introduction of 2-inch quadruplex videotape, the first successful analog recording videotape format. It was much more cost effective, you could record directly from broadcast, making it higher quality video than kinescope, you didn't have to wait for film to develop, and it stored a bit better than film too. On November 20th, 1956, Douglas Edwards with the News on CBS became the first television show to ship videotape recordings to the West Coast, and on January 22nd, 1957, NBC game show Truth or Consequences became the first program to pre-record on videotape. The new format improved distribution and was a huge boon in the preservation of early television which allowed for two concepts that would drive the baby boomer nostalgia market and allow a fledgling cable channel to devote their late night hours to it. Reruns and syndication. It's a rerun. You'll find out. 
The concept of television reruns predated videotape, mostly thanks to I Love Lucy, which, for the record, might be the most important television show ever. During the show's first season, Lucille Ball was pregnant and unable to complete the initial order of 39 episodes before giving birth. As Ball rested, it was decided to rebroadcast some older episodes to fill the space, which the show could successfully do as it was on high quality film and not kinescope. These repeats proved surprisingly popular, and after deciding to make it a regular practice, I Love Lucy was making millions of dollars in ad revenue off of reruns. It was a profitable proof of concept, and the invention of videotape would make it applicable across the board. Media preservation has never been a high priority in any medium, sadly. But if keeping old shows around was lucrative, with little extra cost for the networks, well, suddenly we'll make the effort to save these shows. Back then, television was run by the three big networks, CBS, NBC, and ABC, and the actual local television channels were either completely independent or were network affiliates. Affiliates were sometimes run by the big networks, but more often than not, they were run by outside companies. For example, by 1960, there were over 110 NBC channels in the United States, and only six of those channels were actually owned and operated by NBC, specifically those for the big cities, New York, Washington DC, Chicago, Los Angeles, etc. Network affiliates had a core set of network programming that they were obligated to broadcast, but they also had a set amount of hours that they decided what they aired, called an option time provision in contracts with the networks. This could manifest itself as local programming, but if the affiliate didn't have the means to produce their own television, it could just end up being dead air. And if you bought a television set that cost the same as a car, you might be upset by that dead air. With the ability to distribute shows on videotape, another option for network affiliates presented itself, syndication. Production companies or right holders could directly license their shows to individual channels, allowing them to fill those empty hours with network quality programming without going through the network. Syndication came in two flavors. There was first run syndication, shows made specifically to be syndicated. A lot of credit for the idea goes to Frederick Ziv, whose company, Ziv Television, produced new shows such as The Cisco Kid, Mr. District Attorney, Highway Patrol, and Sea Hunt to sell directly to affiliates. Then there was off-network syndication. Reruns, basically. Shows that had already run on the major networks and could continue to make a profit through licensing. Off-network syndication allowed for shows that were unsuccessful in their initial run to find a new audience, the most famous example of which being the original Star Trek, reruns through syndication turning it into a cult classic. That was the best case scenario. As the decades rolled on and television stopped being a wondrous new technology and instead became an everyday part of life, reruns gained a bit of a reputation as time fillers, hand-me-down programming for when a channel had nothing else to air. Especially as color television began to take over, quickly dating the decades of black and white programming in these syndicated packages, baby boomers didn't want that stuff from when they were kids. They wanted new, hip, exciting programming. The baby boomers were growing up, going to school, going to college, starting careers of their own, starting families. Wait, whoa, slow down. We're in our 30s now. Our 40s are coming up. Stop! I just want to go back! As a cable channel aimed at a child audience, Nickelodeon had little use for the late evening and early morning hours, when its target audience was supposed to be in bed. Nor did they start with enough programming to fill those hours anyway. The channel premiered on April 1st, 1979, with only five shows. Pinwheel, Video Comics, By The Way, Nickelflix, and America Goes Bananas. They were already repeating these programs multiple times a day. So Warner Communications opted to fill the evening slot with a separate premium cable movie channel, Star Channel. This didn't work. Having people pay extra for movies at inconvenient hours wasn't that lucrative. On December 1st, 1979, Star Channel was rebranded as The Movie Channel, and on January 1st, 1980, split off from Nickelodeon to become its own 24-hour movie channel. Then there was the Alpha Repertory Television Service, or ARTS, an arts and culture channel that aired documentaries, theater productions, concerts, and interviews. While it didn't garner a great deal of views, it was by far a better fit for the Nickelodeon of the time. Under the leadership of Cy Schneider, Nickelodeon was pushing an image of being an educational, good-for-kids channel, 
the sort of PBS you paid for, and the programming on arts matched well with their goal. However, it was not a permanent solution. Every year, Warner Amex charged more to lease that channel space, and after arts merged with the entertainment channel to become A&E, it was decided that they would also break off from Nickelodeon and become their own thing in January of 1984. So it was back to the drawing board. By this time, Nickelodeon had been bought by Viacom as part of MTV Networks, and Jerry Layborn, Nickelodeon's new president, was working overtime to revamp the channel's image away from the educational and towards genuine fun programming, which included introducing animated programming, bringing back music videos, and giving the channel's entire visual brand an overhaul. The next task for her and her team, which at the time included Fred Siebert and Alan Goodman, was figuring out what to do with these empty hours. Even if figuring that out meant taking focus away from this new comedy show that Jerry Laybourne had been developing, Turkey Television. The concern was how do we do something that won't turn off our kid audience, yet something that will bring in an adult audience because we know that we need a different economic base for the night. We know there aren't very many kids up in the middle of the night. And we didn't have very much time or very much money. We had two months, one million dollars, and we couldn't turn off our audience. And I remember sitting there for about three Fridays, Friday afternoons with a nice uh, group of about 20, trying to sort this through. What can we do? What can we do? Some of the ideas floated around during this time included a family film channel, an oldies music video channel, a comedy channel, or even just extending Nickelodeon's children programming over the full 24 hours, never mind the fact that kids weren't going to watch The Adventures of Black Beauty at 3 in the morning. In the meantime, the late evening, early morning hours were being occupied with tech slides advertising daytime programming. Now, in 1984, during the major changeover from Warner Amex to Viacom and Cy Schneider to Jerry Laybourne, Nickelodeon purchased the syndication rights to 200 episodes of the classic 50s adventure show, Lassie. This wasn't that odd of a fit for the channel as you might think. Outdoor adventure shows like The Adventures of Black Beauty, Adventures in Rainbow Country, and Matt and Jenny have been populating the channel for a few years now and Cy Schneider had opted to either get the broadcast rights to older pre-existing educational children's content or emulate old eras of television in the channel's new programming, the biggest success of which was bringing back 50s television science guy, Mr. Wizard. And even all the way back at the beginning in 1979, Nickelodeon hooked into this kind of vague turn of the century nostalgia with penny arcades and old Flash Gordon film serials and playing piano covers of Teresa Brewer songs. But Lassie was the first time Nickelodeon just up and aired a classic 50s black and white children's show, something that people of the baby boomer generation might have watched themselves as children. Baby boomers who are now themselves parents, raising children and checking out this Nickelodeon thing they heard about to see if it was right for them. And the response from these parents was overwhelmingly positive. I was getting all these lovely letters saying, it's so great that you're introducing my kid to something that I had as a kid. And suddenly it's like, whack, you know, that's there what we is. do. It's right there. In 1985, the youngest baby boomers were turning 21. The legal right to drink alcohol being the last significant hurdle into adulthood as they started families or finished up college. The oldest baby boomers were turning 39 on the edge of middle age. The term midlife crisis had been coined only 20 years prior. On both ends of the spectrum, baby boomers were finding themselves in transitionary periods of their lives. A study done by the Department of Psychology at Lemoyne College in 1995 determined that people get the most intensely nostalgic, not specifically from being old, but from moments of transition. Of particular interest was the finding of peak nostalgia for many items during the college years, rather than among the elderly. On one hand, the college years represented a period of major development transitions, including for many college students some degree of homesickness. On the other hand, this finding contradicts the stereotype of nostalgia as primarily characteristic of aging. So it was a good time to appeal to baby boomer childhood nostalgia, 
and 50s and 60s nostalgia had already proven itself a lucrative market. The 1970s has seen a rise of some very popular television shows like Happy Days, movies like Grease and American Graffiti, and music like Sha Na Na, which all looked back to the 50s and 60s. It's the nostalgia cycle, and it's been guiding market trends for decades now. But if it was just the nostalgia cycle, then why weren't the reruns elsewhere getting noticeable attention? Old syndicated reruns hadn't gone away. It wouldn't have been hard at all for nostalgic baby boomers to find something from their youth. Here's a random TV schedule from October 1st, 1984, the day Lassie premiered on Nickelodeon. It's from the Globe Gazette, the local paper of Mason City, Iowa. We have I Dream of Jeannie, Blondie, Bewitched, My Little Margie, I Love Lucy, The Many Loves of Dobie Gillis, Bachelor Father, The Beverly Hillbillies, The Big Valley, Perry Mason, Ben Casey, I Mary Joan, The Andy Griffith Show, The Flintstones, The Brady Bunch, Here's Lucy, Leave It to Beaver, The Munsters, The Flying Nun, Gidget, The Lucy Show, The Rifleman, Here Comes the Brides, Gomer Pyle, Dragnet, and The Cisco Kid. All of that in one day and on free television from the antenna. Why in the world do these parents gravitate towards reruns of Lassie on a paid cable channel? And if we were to, say, put a block of old reruns during those late evening, early morning hours, why in the world would they care to watch that? Cable television was supposed to be this new, hip, exciting thing for the medium. HBO even advertised itself as the answer to reruns. Putting those same reruns you find on your local independent stations onto your cable channel would seem antithetical to why cable even exists. But framing is everything. People knew that the reruns on free stations were just there for filler. Uh, we've got an empty spot between some game shows and the news. Um, well, we can get the syndicated package for Lassie pretty cheap. Let's do that. It gives an image of Lassie not having much value and a television station too cheap to put new stuff out there. But Nickelodeon isn't a random network affiliate. It's a themed cable channel, a curated experience where, in theory, everything is hand-selected with reason. I mean, it better be. You are paying for the experience. Nickelodeon is advertised as a cable channel of quality children's programming. Airing Lassie on Nickelodeon is saying that Lassie is quality children's programming. It's a stamp of approval. And when baby boomers who watch Lassie as children see this, they feel that their viewing habits as children are affirmed. It was good to watch Lassie as a kid because Nickelodeon is saying it's still good for kids to watch Lassie. The parents were responding to this and maybe there was something Nickelodeon could do with these reruns. You know, people were doing reruns, but everybody f looked down on them. And so our battle cry was, we are going to have the best prints. I mean, these are very modest things that we said, but we're going to have the best prints. We're going to treat this like this material is golden. This is our television past, and we are introducing it to our kids. Nobody knew this better than Siebert and Goodman who back in 1983 had tried to convince ABC to create a TV oldies block as part of their daytime programming, which ABC turned down. The stigma of reruns were just too strong. Now, by pure coincidence, Bob Pittman, head of MTV Networks, had purchased the broadcast rights to all 275 episodes of The Donna Reed Show, a family sitcom that aired on ABC between 1958 and 1966. He purchased them through Colex Enterprises, a television syndication company that distributed the works of Screen Gems, which included other shows like Route 66 and Dennis the Menace. Pittman didn't really have a plan for the Donna Reese show, but the episodes were cheap. Might as well keep them around if we have a spot we need to fill. You know, like standard television. So when Nick came a-calling, Alan and I had worked out the whole thing in our heads we could run an entire network with programming that no one else wanted, but was solid enough to get a good rating. Perfect for the audience and perfect for advertisers. Our channel would be the television equivalent of Oldies Radio, the most successful format in decades. Just like the greatest hits of all time, we wouldn't try to hide what we were. The networks might have reruns, sad face, but at Nick at Night, we'd be reruns, happy face. It would be a blast. The powers that be at Nickelodeon did not like the Donna Reed show at all. 
it was seen as a pre-feminist throwback that set a depressing role model. I watched it for weeks at a time in high school during an illness and figured any show that could hold the attention of a high school boy for weeks had to be, at the very least, entertaining. We convinced them to give it a try. Look for shows that fit the budget, were good, meaning strong characters and solid stories, package it all up under our guidance, and go for it. No one was sure what we were smoking, but after our last ditch presentation to Pittman, met with smiles and enthusiasm, they agreed to let us at it. So Nickelodeon got to work buying a few more syndication packages and putting together a new programming block. Announced to the public at the end of May, Nick and Knight would premiere on July 1st, 1985 at 8 p.m. Eastern. Everybody knows Nickelodeon's got a new all-star lineup of new shows and old favorites called Nick at Night. That's keeping Nickelodeon going around the clock 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. But some of you aren't getting Nick at Night. Nickelodeon goes off the air and minutes hang like hours. Hours feel like years. But you don't have to be left out in the cold. Call your local cable company and tell them you want Nick at Night. You need Nick at Night. You gotta have Nick at Night. It's up to you. They won't know if you don't call. So pick up the phone and call now. Here's a rundown of its opening lineup. First at 8 o'clock was Dennis the Menace, a 1959 family sitcom based on the Hank Ketchum gag comic of the same name. Why don't we go down and have a bologna sandwich? Dennis, get in bed. Okay. <sighs> thank goodness. Mom, how come you always say thank goodness instead of good night? <laughs> With its child antics, Nickelodeon opted to also air Dennis the Menace during the daytime Nickelodeon hours as a bit of a sample of what Nick at Night had to offer. Then at 8.30, the Donna Reed Show. Donna Reed plays Donna Stone, a middle-class housewife taking care of her two kids and pediatrician husband. After watching the Donna Reed Show, do you ever have the uncontrollable desire to go out and do good? Beware. Nick at Night scientists have discovered powerful subliminal messages embedded in the Donna Reed show. In the interest of your free will, we have slowed down this Donna Reed footage. See for yourself. Donna Reed. So much more than meets the eye every night on Nick at Night. What's this for? Um, don't discuss politics. Uh. And this? Uh, black tie. Oh, and darling, don't keep calling her husband Donald. Why not? Donald was her first husband. Oh. Thank you, darling. I don't know what I'd do without you as my navigator. You'd probably get lost. We'll have more to say about that show a few episodes from now. But for a time, Donna Reed would become the unofficial mascot for Nick at Night, much of the promotion rotating around her and her character. The perfect home, the perfect husband, the perfect family. Television taught you it would be like this someday. And now it can be as Nick at Night shows you how to be Donna Reed. It's a five-part home study in the fine art of being Donna. The road to excellence can be messy. Oh. <laughs> so let Nick at Night transform you into the perfect woman you always wanted to be. How to be Donna Reed. A five-episode Mother's Day special starting promptly at 8, 7 central on Nick at Night. Nick at Night presents Global Village News. The effects of the seven-day Donathon continue to spread. In Chicago, the annual Lakeside Marathon became a Donathon, as every single entrant ran in Donna's trademark floral print with belted skirts and cuffed three-quarter sleeves. The race had a winner, but over coffee and cake afterwards, the contestants agreed that it's not whether you won or lost, but how you ran the race. Global Village News. If we don't cover it, it doesn't matter. Both of these shows were placed under the banner of Camp Nickelodeon, a sort of transitionary point between daytime Nickelodeon and Nick at Night. The shows act as buffer between the two services we offer. We start looking for teens and the older audience, or rather, a broader audience at eight. We run Lassie during the daytime programming and we're surprised to find how many older viewers were watching it. We found an audience wanting some nostalgic programming, and that's why we begin Nick at Night with those two series. They're campy. Coming next on Nick at Night, the Nick at Night movie. Then at 9 o'clock, the Nick at Night movie, which is exactly what you think it is. Old classic movies like His Girl Friday and A Star is Born, 
The very first Nick at Night movie was 1939's The Little Princess, starring Shirley Temple, which is not only a proper classic, but also had the added benefit of being in the public domain. Then at 11 o'clock, an hour of turkey television, Nickelodeon's original comedy series that Jerry Laybourne was not fond of. I'm tired of dancing, fed up with eating out. I've had it with the symphony, I wanna sing and shout, oh, it's turkey television. It's strange, it's weird, it's really neat. <laughs> ha, 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 la, ha, ha, la, ha, ha, la, so it's turkey television. It's TV good enough to eat. Weekends at midnight, 11 central on Nick at Night. Yeah. Uh-huh. Do you still have the original teeth? Yeah, yeah, sure do. Yeah, sure do, Sonny. <laughs> but they look so white and healthy. You must take great care of them. Oh, no, no, these are dentures. There's the real teeth. Saved them all, yeah, they're as good as new. Oh, gross! Turkey TV does bear a passing resemblance to the USA Network's popular late night, early morning night flight program. But its juvenile humor, freaky, weird music videos, and contemporary stand-up acts were completely out of sync with Nick at Night's retro intent. The logic, it seems, was to have something for the up-late college student. By this time, we thought older people would already be watching, and we thought it was terrific for a comedy show. We have acquired clips from all over the world. The show ranges from music videos to Charlie Chaplin to game shows from other countries. There's also some blooper type material, stand-up comedians, and some of our original programming, like skits. Then at midnight, Route 66, a 1960 drama series about two young men traveling the United States in their Chevrolet Corvette, with our two protagonists, Todd and Buzz, finding themselves in the middle of other people's problems. The 60s. Crew cuts, convertible Corvettes, two guys looking for some answers. Route 66, Saturdays at 1110 Central on Nick at Night. Cut it out. Hey, I'm entitled to leave my mark. It's 296 steps up and 296 steps down. Don't you got any respect? Respect for what? What are you, some kind of squares? Men died here. There's nothing square about that. Beat it. Ah, come on. This was not a sitcom, a rarity for Nick at Night's 35 year run. Originally, there was going to be a block of time for comedies, then a block of time for dramas, but the comedies quickly took over. Still, right out of the gate, they knew that Nick at Night had to present itself as a curated service. What Derek Compare calls in his 2005 book, Rerun Nation, television boutiques. Unlike independent broadcast stations, Nick at Night and TV Land are no mere rerun venues. They are methodically constructed shrines of the television heritage, where past programs are immersed in the stylized array of promotional material and intertextual associations. In short, they are television-themed television boutiques, and reflexively function as a kind of living history, the television heritage incarnate. After an hour-long episode of Route 66, Nickelodeon would rotate through the programs again. Dennis, Donna Reed, Movie, Turkey, and Root, with Nickelodeon starting up again at 6 a.m. with Danger Mouse. On Saturdays, National Geographic Explorer's three-hour block of documentaries would take over. Come on in. The water's fine. Sunday on National Geographic Explorer. Starting at 5, 4 central on Nick at Night. You may have noticed a surprising absence in all of this. Lassie, which had showed Nickelodeon that there was a market for this kind of thing in the first place. In fact, Lassie wouldn't become a part of Nick at Night until 1989. Why might that have been? Well, this is just a theory, but the syndication contract for Lassie was made before Nick at Night was even conceived and didn't account for it. That matters because Nick at Night isn't just a programming block on Nickelodeon. Like Star Channel and Arts before it, Nick at Night is actually, legally, a separate television channel from Nickelodeon. The ratings are recorded separately and the advertisers are selected separately. Putting Lassie on Nick at Night would almost certainly require a new contract, maybe even buying the syndication package a second time. Not a great use of their budget. 
In contrast, the Donna Reed show had been licensed for the entirety of MTV networks, and presumably so were the two other Colex Enterprises shows. It would be a while before Nick and Knight started to expand its offerings. The only show added in 1985 was My Three Sons that November, replacing, of all things, Dennis the Menace. Turkey Television, you get to stay. On the 23rd episode of My Three Sons, Robbie went haywire and shattered the show's clean-cut image with bad language. What happened? My Three Sons, we thought you should know on Nick at Night. It was a low-key start for Nick and Knight, but even then, it was getting attention. Right now, we are getting a lot of informal response. People are calling and asking, what can I look forward to? We're very encouraged by our start. We'll keep the future programming in the same spirit. Nick and Knight just makes sense. By 1990, Nick and Knight averaged a little less than half a million viewers, which isn't a lot by television standards, but they were a concentrated audience in the aught soft after 18 to 45 demographic who have enough disposable income to buy cable television, making it an appealing channel for advertisers. Siebert and Goodman were very hands-on with Nick and Knight for a few years, bringing in a lot of people they worked with in the past to work on the channel's visual design and promotional material, including Tom Corey and Scott Nash, the men who developed Nickelodeon's Orange Splat logo. Early Nick and Knight promos leaned heavily into a retro visual design while maintaining a certain level of good-natured ribbing at the channel's content. You wrote to us. You told us who you are. Now meet the TV generation. Laura Darvis, Lakewood, Ohio. Her first babysitter was the Mickey Mouse Club. She watches Nick at Night. Karen Andre, Northampton, Massachusetts. Still hopes to elope with Rob Petrie. She watches Nick at Night. Cheryl Haber, Houston, Texas. Dreams of going stag to the cocktail party on Laugh-In. She watches Nick at Night. Nick at Night, the network for the TV generation. The balance between humor, nostalgia, and preservation was tricky, but oh so important. In 1996, an in-house segmentation study found that the dedicated adult audience of Nick Knight can be typically split into three groups. First, there are the wholesome viewers, those who genuinely feel that television of a certain vintage is better than contemporary television, usually for reasons of moral values. Oh, Cheers is such a filthy show that promotes alcoholism. Let's watch Donna Reed instead, when this country had good values. The second group are the escapist viewers, those looking for a less intense viewing experience, something they can unwind with after a long day at work and they don't feel like watching something serious. Oh, I am too run down to deal with the evening news and Hill Street Blues is too depressing. Oh, Donna Reed, take me away from this dreary world. The third group are the ironic viewers, those watching in a distanced manner, pointing and riffing and making fun of the antiquity of the show for any number of reasons. Maybe because its old style of comedy feels so weird to modern sensibilities, or maybe because the gender and racial politics are woefully outdated, or maybe because the production design isn't up to snuff. Oh man, my women's history professor would kick Donna Reed's ass for being so subservient. And these sets look so cheap. These aren't truly divided groups. There are three types of viewing sensibilities that tend to bleed into each other by degrees. But they are all types of audiences that Nick at Night aims to appeal to. Nostalgia for the escapists, a wink and a nudge for the ironics, and for the wholesomes, a pristine presentation of 30-year-old television both in terms of television selection and actual visual quality. We set up a meeting with our scheduling and promotion departments, find what the environment is, and make sure the proposed show complements our other titles. It has to be TV land or TV referential, something our TV generation audience grew up with. Then we negotiate and set terms for the license period, exclusivity, and the number of runs. If it has a lot of episodes, like Donna Reed with 250 plus, then we don't have as many runs as we might with Bewitched, which has fewer episodes. All our prints are gorgeous. In syndication, the prints are usually dirty because they still use 16mm. We go back to the 35mm master and transfer to 1 inch tape. When possible, we go from the negative. It's expensive, but it's the cleanest way to do it. It's part of the TV land appeal to see these shows the way they were first shown. That's Diana Rabina, 
then the director of acquisitions, later the senior vice president of programming for both Nick and Knight and its future spin-off channel, TV Land. She won the job in a contest. No, really. In 1987, Nick at Night ran the I Wanna Be Manager of Acquisitions contest. Do you dream about the robot from Lost in Space? Do you own a Gumby? Do you speak the TV language? You bet your bippy I do. Then Nick at Night would like to offer you the chance to get a job watching what? TV for a living. Tell me more. As our manager of acquisitions, you'd watch thousands of hours of TV to help choose new shows for the network. But am I qualified? Just take this simple test. What is the Goober hypothesis? Why is there Bert Convy? For more details, stay tuned to Nick at Night. Okay. Hi, I'm Margie Bino, Vice President of Human Resources for Nick at Night. If you've seen these ads, then you know that we're offering you the chance to apply for a job watching TV for a living. As our manager of acquisitions, you'd watch thousands of hours of TV to help us choose new shows for the network. Interested? Then let me tell you about our benefits. We offer an outstanding dental plan, excellent dining facilities, and of course, free soda. To learn how you can apply for this rewarding career, stay tuned to Nick at Night. Now, at no point did Nickelodeon intend to hire just any rando with no television production experience. Rabina was an employee of Group W Cable in Manhattan. But that wasn't the point. The point was to make the audience feel inclusive to Nick at Night and its programming. We care about your feelings, your nostalgia, the shows from your childhood that you want to see again. We care so much that we want one of you to come work for us and make sure we do it right. It's the adult version of Nickelodeon's tactics at making its child audience feel included. Nickelodeon is just for kids, and Nick and Knight is just for baby boomer moms and dads. Of course, I'm not a baby boomer mom or dad. There is another experience to account for here, that of being the child getting introduced to these old shows from that fuzzy, nebulous period of before you were born. While Nick and Knight wasn't made for kids, it was almost always safe for kids to watch. And unless your house had really strict bedtimes, you could usually catch a few hours of it if you wished. Speaking personally, Nick and Knight was always a place for discovery, learning of the existence of these old shows that I could then ask my parents about, something I could connect with them about. My favorite Nick and Knight show was probably Get Smart, which joined the Nick and Knight family in 1991. The fact that it starred Inspector Gadget gave me a way in for its lighthearted spy spoofery. Nick and Knight wasn't the only thing piquing my interest in television history, but it was certainly a major contributor. Its presentation as a fun, curated experience drawing me in, whereas the syndicated reruns of the network affiliates could be easily ignored. As the years have rolled on, the audience has shifted. 50s and 60s television became 70s and 80s television, then became 90s and 2000s television. The Donna Reed show has faded away and has been replaced with Friends. That's to be expected. As warm and nostalgic as Nick and Knight can get, it is aiming for that specific audience, the parents in transition who buy the cable packages with Nickelodeon. And that's not the baby boomers anymore, but the millennials. And next year, guess what? The oldest millennials turn 39, the same as the oldest baby boomers when Nick and Knight got its start. We are in transition, and we are the nostalgic ones now. Not that I mind, of course. It doesn't escape me that I'm treating Nick and Knight in the same curated way as Nick and Knight was treating its programming. I wouldn't have an audience otherwise. The nostalgia market is strong. It's good to remember that they're always selling you something, but sometimes it's a-okay to enjoy what they're selling you. Nick, 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 Oh, yeah, so obviously this isn't the whole Nick and Knight story. It grows and evolves as much as Nickelodeon. However, I've decided not to cover Nick at Night show by show like I am Nickelodeon. My excuse here is that it's technically a separate channel from Nick, so it doesn't go against Nick Knack's mission statement. In practical terms, including the Nick at Night schedule into Nick Knacks would increase my workload by about a third, and I do want to get to Nicktoons before I die, but I'm also not going to ignore it. When I do my year introductory episodes, I'll be including a segment that goes over what was airing on Nick at Night that time, what promotions they were doing, you know, things like that. 
There's also a solid chunk of shows that aired both on Nickelodeon and Nick at Night that I'll be talking about. We'll be seeing episodes on The Donna Reed Show, My Three Sons, and Mr. Ed in Nickelodeon 1986, so there's plenty of retro 50s TV to discuss. We're going to have a lot of fun, I promise. Next time, we kick off Nickelodeon 1986 with a barely animated show about a monkey who just can't keep his hands to himself. I mean, they say he's a monkey. He doesn't have a tail, which means he's an ape, but... Oh, never mind. Today's research shout-out goes to Rerun Nation, How Repeats Invented American Television by Derek Compare. A very interesting read about rerun culture and syndication, and how channels like Nick and Knight change the way we look at them. Thank y'all for watching. This was a hefty one. Nick and Knight is a channel about television history, and it seemed odd not to talk about television history in relation to the Television History Channel on my Television History Channel. If you'd like to support Nick Knacks and other Poparina projects, consider contributing to my Patreon. Every dollar goes to production values, research materials, and making sure I don't freeze to death like the little match girl. You can also support Nick Knacks by liking the video, subscribing to the channel, hitting that bell icon for notifications, leaving a comment, following me on Twitter, sending a one-time donation through PayPal or Coffee, and sharing knickknacks with all your friends. 1985 down, bring on 1986.